Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastian Couture, and today my guest is Nick Johnson. He's the founder of ENS. ENS is the Ethereum name service. It is the most used, most widely used decentralized naming service and the biggest DAO on Ethereum. And um, we had Nick on a year ago, and so we're having him back on today to give us a bit of an update on ENS and talk about some of the um, interesting technical things that are happening with the protocol in terms of expanding to L2s. We'll also talk about governance. Uh, we'll talk about some of the growth that ENS has seen in the last little while and also looking to the future and uh, where the project is going. Nick, thanks for coming on. Pleasure to be here again. So for those who missed the last episode who maybe had never heard of you or never heard of ENS, which I'm sure uh, as very few people. Um, yeah, why, why don't we start with a bit of background and uh, you know, how you became interested in uh, decentralized naming services? Sure, well, yeah. Uh, so I've been a, a software engineer uh, for about, God, about 20 years now. Um, and I've always had interest in sort of internet infrastructure and so forth. Um, and you know, when, when I first heard about Bitcoin way back, I sort of looked into it and I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting, but oh, it's just money, you know, like there's what I really want is a programmable platform. And so I sort of ignored it for a while. And then sometime later came across Ethereum and went suddenly, wow, this is exactly what I was thinking about. This is really very cool. Uh, started playing around with it almost immediately. Uh, and um, inside of you know three months, was got a call from the Ethereum Foundation saying, "Hey, would you like to come work with us on on uh, you know Go Ethereum or on Swarm or you know something something we're working on?" Um, it was a bit of a plunge for me because it was going from the comfort of like full employment to to a contractor position, you know, big pay cut, uh, you know, unknown future, etc. But I was really quite hooked on you know Ethereum and and what we could build with it. Uh, and so I, I quit my job, I, I joined the Ethereum Foundation, and pretty much one of my first jobs was to start working on, um, uh, well, I, I started working on Swarm, uh, and my first sort of side project was, you know, what can I build in the way of a naming service? Because one of the very first things that I noticed was how bad the user experience is with, you know, 42 character long hexadecimal addresses and so forth. And I was like, why is this not already here? You know, this seems like a really basic bit of infrastructure to allow people to, you know, not just transact with each other, but interact with contracts and so forth without having to know, uh, you know, the these identifiers. You know, we solved this on the internet in like 1985. Um, so I started working on what eventually became the Ethereum name service. Um, started off as a sort of a side project from within the EF. Um, gradually grew to take more of my time until it was my full-time job there. Uh, and then at some point the EF went, well, you know, it's clear that this is more than one person's work. Um, you know, what about we we spin you out into your own organization, give you a generous grant to get started, and you can build this as, as a full-time project with, you know, with funding. So it, basically it went from there. Cool. Yeah, so, I mean, one of the things that I think is is interesting about the um, the decentralized namespace or you know, the the use case of decentralized names in in crypto is that because it's so easy to build uh, it's so easy to build applications on 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 blockchains whether that's Ethereum or Cosmos or Solana or whatever L1 right uh, or L2 there's been a multitude of uh, decentralized namespaces. That have emerged that have popped up over the years of course like ens i think was one of the first ones uh, we also have protocols like uh unstoppable domains we have uh handshake also um and and then you know cosmos has their own and like each blockchain on cosmos pretty much has their own solana has one i think and you know polygon um it, it's very you, you mentioned this like early days of the internet and how we solved this problem um but but the, the the thing about how the internet solved this problem is because this infra because all the infrastructure wasn't there it was you know they um i can and sort of the domain name service uh was able to generate like tremendous network effect around like a single naming system and that's the domain name system 
Now that's it's very different in crypto, right? Because it's so easy to to, to sort of like bring these up. H how do you think about the future of name services and you know how we will reason about these different name spaces in the future? Will everything sort of coalesce to ENS or sort of resolve back to ENS and uh, and and have this one main naming service, or or do you think there can be you know many different name services that sort of compete with each other or that are complementary? And how, how do you see that playing out? I mean, uh, you know, naturally I'm biased here, but I would like to see ENS and, and more generally the global namespace win. So, you know, when I say the global namespace, ENS has .eth, but we also integrate with DNS transparently. So any DNS name is an ENS name as well. Um, and I think that sort of approach is a better one than, than 10,000 competing name services. There's, you know, there's a few problems with that, but the biggest of them is collisions and, you know, inevitably more than one naming service springs up that, that uh, issues names that collide with each other, uh, in which case you have situations where different people might get different resolutions for the same name. Um, that's a recipe for disaster, both in terms of, you know, accidental losses of funds and so forth. And also it's just, it's a dream for phishing and scamming and, and so forth. Um, so what what I would love to see is, you know, it doesn't have to be ENS and, and DNS and that's it, but I would love to see more naming services and more chains integrate with ENS via the mechanisms we've exposed uh, that make it possible to have a single unified namespace, even if parts of it are administered differently uh, or specifically to a given chain, they can all be in a single namespace and resolvable by a single client. Um, I think it's also, you know, worth pointing out just the huge overhead this imposes on um, wallets and apps and so on to implement all of these and to independently decide how they're going to handle you know each of the services and their potential collisions and so forth that it, it can create a, a mess um, and so yeah what I'd love to see is is ENS dominant naturally but in a, a collaborative way yeah I mean of course I think that, that makes sense uh, it, it makes sense for for everybody to be using the same namespace, right? I mean, at least from a practical perspective and from the perspective of avoiding collisions. Yeah, um, I, I I see you're you're very hopeful, but I, I I don't I don't know how like if we have you know if we continue to have like L ones um, with their own communities and sort of their own application space, and I think it will be difficult to. Uh, for everyone to align on on one namespace, although we can we can remain hopeful, I guess. I guess, um, yeah. What are some of the um, what are some of the coolest use cases that you you've seen people implement using ENS? You know, beyond just having a a, a name attached to their Ethereum address. Like, what are some unique things that people are doing with ENS these days? Uh, I think some of the the sort of programmatic integrations. Like, there are various efforts where you can. Uh, you know, you send some ETH to, uh, you know, die.swap.eth or whatnot. Don't, please don't use that. I don't know if it actually works. Um, but, you know, along those lines, uh, and it swaps it for die just transparently. So you can remove the need for a UI entirely and just automate this sort of thing. Uh, and that sort of thing's possible as well for, you know, automatically naming contract accounts, for automatically naming, um, you know, accounts on exchanges, deposit addresses, and so on and so forth. Um I've, you know, I've seen some cool efforts around automatically issuing people or sorry, easily issuing people subdomains and so on for themselves, you know, associated with some affiliation of theirs, you know, so we've seen like Decentraland use it quite heavily. Um, and I guess, you know, some of the DNS integrations that we're seeing showing up now, like .art and .box and so on, you know, .box through, um, uh, through their registrar are now making it possible to register .box names. Uh, natively on chain, so you can do it entirely through your Ethereum client, um, and then have the name owned as an NFT. So if you want to transfer the .box domain, you transfer the NFT, and that's the authoritative record of ownership. How does that work exactly? Uh, effectively, what happens is that the .box has like a holding company that holds all the wrapped names, um, and they have a contract that basically says, you know, if you can prove you own the NFT, then we'll follow your instructions on on what to do with it. Uh, and so, you know, that way it, it's adherent to all the the ICANN regulations around who is data and so on and so forth. But you still have direct control over the name. And if you want to transfer it out, you can. They simply transfer ownership to 
you at some other registrar. Okay. And so then when you want to sort of manage your DNS, uh, the DNS for the domain, you'll do that using sort of like a Web3 authentication? Is that... Yes, exactly. You sign in with Ethereum to sign into their interface and and manage it just like any other name. Oh, that's super cool. I really like that. All right, I'm going to get a box domain. (laughs) Neat. Uh, Is this this an integration that you guys help um, put together? Because I mean, I, I didn't even know about this dot box uh, domain extension. Yeah, it's that uh, it's it was one of the 2012 you know extensions that were the, the extensions that were optioned in 2012. But some of these had launched earlier than others, and Dotbox is one of the later ones. But that's allowed them to take advantage of this when it might have been difficult to do so if they'd already launched and had a lot of you know unwrapped registrations. Um, yeah, no, we we work quite closely with them on on setting this up and so forth, and we've been really pleased to see them embracing ENS for it. That's cool. And do, are, are you guys, um, you know, do you guys interact with, or have you interacted with, you know, ICANN or any of the folks you know working in the uh, in the more traditional domain name uh, registration space? And what's been your experience there, and how like have they been receptive to? To the idea of ENS, yeah. Yep. So, so we've uh, we've attended and presented at uh, DNS OARC, which is uh, a an industry organisation for DNS. We're active members of that. Um, in addition, you know, we've we've attended ICANN meetings and so forth. We've found uh, a lot of people in the DNS world are, are quite receptive once you make it clear that this isn't a cash grab. Basically, you know, that we're actually seriously tried to build real useful infrastructure not just a platform for speculation uh which you know given crypto's sometimes reputation in in the wider world you know is is people's initial assumption um i can itself tends to be very conservative uh and you know understandably they're they're protecting a, a core piece of internet internet infrastructure um we're still working on convincing them that you know, working with us is is better than uh, trying to pretend we don't exist, uh, and I'm confident we'll we'll get there. But they're they're understandably cautious, um, and the the competitors we ref- we've talked about previously, you know, some of them issue hundreds or thousands of top level domains um, that inevitably collide with the DNS route, and that causes a lot of of discord there. And so when we approach ICANN and other Web two uh, organizations where we're sort of careful to emphasize that our goal is to build with these pieces of infrastructure not you know override them basically yeah I, I remember speaking with the handshake folks like a couple of years ago on the podcast and their their view was that you know they they did have overlapping um, extensions but that they wanted to they wanted them to be compatible with ICANN uh, in a way that wouldn't uh, create collisions, and you know, from from the perspective of of um, of ENS, it's like ENS works nicely with ICANN domains from the perspective that you can you can connect uh, in a way your 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 ENS name to an, an ICANN domain. Um, can, can you just like remind us how that works and what's the technical sort of um, uh, the, the the technical bits that allow this to to, to be possible? Yeah, so so all of that works through DNSSEC, which is a security layer on top of the the base DNS layer. Uh, the way DNSSEC works is uh, you sign your zone, so your your DNS records uh, with a key you own, and then the parent zone. So say you've got you know eth dot link, then the dot link zone signs your keys, and then the root zone uh, signs the dot link keys, and then there's a root key that everybody knows, and so you have this chain of trust that establishes that. Uh, you know, this name was authorized by all the relevant authorities along the way down to your domain. Um, and so the way we do DNS integration is you enable DNSSEC for your zone, uh, for your name, you sign it, and then you set a text record uh, saying, you know, I want the owner of this name on ENS to be 0x whatever address. Uh, and we're able to prove all of that on chain because it's all cryptographically signed. It uses, you know, either RSA or uh, ECDSA and we can verify the signatures on chain to then transfer ownership to you of the the record. Uh, uh, the the one wrinkle here is an increasing number of DNSSEC implementations use ECDSA, and they use a curve that isn't the one Ethereum uses. 
Uh, and so verifying it can be quite costly, um, you know, up to a million gas per, per link, basically. Um, there's a few approaches we're taking to, to reduce that. Uh, one is there are now more efficient uh, libraries that cost less gas. Uh, another is there's an EIP out at the moment to add the uh, SecP256 R1 curve to Ethereum, which would enable not just efficient DNS set, but a whole lot of other uh, crypto primitives from sort of the real world, because it's a very commonly used curve. Um, and the final one is our effort on what we call gasless DNS set, which is basically instead of verifying on chain in a transaction that you own the name at the time you update it, uh, we move that to when you try and resolve the name, you go and verify the DNS proofs at time. And we do that transparently to the client using our what's actually our L2 strategy called CCIP read, uh, which makes it possible for a client like Ethers to resolve the name and behind the scenes do a DNS verification without actually the client having to know anything about that. So yeah, that's a good transition, I guess, into uh, the L2 strategy. So if, for now, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, or, or up until recently, because I think ENS works now with, with L2s, but ENS was all, only compatible uh, with layer one Ethereum natively. Uh, now there's there's a there's a push to have ENS be compatible on Ethereum L2s like Optimism, Arbitrum, etc. Um, can you talk about what are the technical challenges there? Why has been why has that been difficult? And you know what's the technical implementation to to enable this? I think the the ultimate challenge is that ENS is quite unlike a lot of other projects. Like if you have a token uh, or you know you want to to bridge it to multiple networks, that's fine. You have a few here, a few there. If you have you know, an exchange or some sort of DeFi primitive, you can deploy it independently on each chain, and that's not a problem. You you sort of have liquidity fragmentation, but you know that's tolerable. ENS is a little different because we have this global namespace, and so any deployment on other chains needs to have some sort of connection so that we know we won't issue the same name to different people in different places and so forth. Uh, and so... What that ultimately means is that ENS will always be rooted on Ethereum L1, but that doesn't preclude moving arbitrarily large parts of the tree off into uh, different L2s and so forth. And that's the approach we've taken with our um, our solution, which is called CCIP Read, and basically allows you to delegate entire parts of the ENS hierarchy to an L2 or even to a private database or you know anything you can verify on chain, basically. Um, and so if you, for example, own, you know, wallet.eth and you want to issue subdomains to people, you can delegate wallet.eth to the L2 of your choice, issue them on the L2, uh, and people can resolve them transparently without having to know which L2 it's on and without any additional trust assumptions, which seems outrageous, but it is possible. So could you describe this, the CCIP read, um, functionality? I've, I've heard about it, but I'm like not super uh, in tune with how that works and yeah so the basic process of resolving an ENS name is that you call a smart contract you know grossly simplified you call a smart contract you say what does net.eth resolve to and it returns a result and that's all on L1 the extension with CCIP read is you call the contract you ask what it resolves to and it returns uh, a revert an error basically saying I need more information to complete this request and then more information is, please go make an HTTP request to this endpoint with this data and then return it to me. And the client then goes off and transparently does that, um, you know, as part of the contract call, um, returns the data to the contract, which then has an opportunity to verify that the data is actually correct. So how that works in practice is, say, your, your data is stored on optimism. You try and resolve nick.eth, it goes, please consult the optimism gateway and give me back what it what it returns the optimism gateway gives you then the resolution in nick.eth along with all the merkle proofs required to prove that that's part of the optimism state route um, and then when you pass it back to the contract it verifies that the the proofs are correct and therefore that the the result is correct and returns it to you and so what it looks like from the point of view of the client you know the the app using ethers is you just did a regular contract call and you got the data back um, and then we're building generic gateways and we're building libraries and so on that mean when you're writing the L1 contract, it can be quite straightforward as well. It just says, 
you know, I depend on this storage slot from this chain. Um, and then all the verification happens in libraries and so forth. So, so essentially the, the contract is able to revert, say if it doesn't have the data, it, it tells the client, I don't have the data, um, but here's an HTTP request that the client can independently make in order to, to get the data essentially from a, a centralized or like an, an off chain source. That source returns the data with proofs that the data is in fact correct. And then sends it back to the sends it back to the client. So so there's a um, there's a liveness risk here, but there isn't necessarily like a there's no trust risk, right? Okay, yeah, exactly. And that's that's the thing because ultimately every roll up in order to be a roll up has to be able to prove things on L one. Um, it means that the strategy works for any roll up. So you know it's easiest for us with EVM based roll ups because we can just deploy the existing contracts we have you know with very few changes we need a bit of library code to deal with how that particular roll up uh, proves its state on the l1 um but it could in principle it can be used with any sort of l2 you know zk proof ones as well as long as you just have some way to prove that a response from the roll up is is correct this particular like uh, EN, uh eip uh would, would it also allow reading from like IPFS or some decentralized storage source or it would only be uh, off-chain resources? Uh, it, it absolutely does. Uh, and of course, the trust model depends on the trust model of the thing you're reading from. So for instance, you could uh, you could store a Merkle root in your, uh, you know, your contract on L1 and then your gateway could read data out of IPFS and return it. And the trust model there would be that you have to trust the root that was committed on L1 um, equally, it could return things from just a centralized database where all the records are signed and the contract verifies the signature. And then your trust model is, of course, that the signer is, is honest. Okay, got it. And so with, with regards to how L2s are using this now, practically speaking, uh, if, you're, uh, if you've registered an ENS name on, on Ethereum, on, on mainnet Ethereum, uh, I mean, typically with I, mean, I think there are some exceptions, but the the your your address is the same on Ethereum as it is on L2s. Uh, why why does that correspondence simply not work? Why do you need like an extra layer in order to? Uh, I mean, couldn't you just like check with Ethereum what the address is, like with some kind of message passing, um, rather than having the L2 needing to have its own um, namespace? So yeah, so I guess there's a there's a few issues here. One is, of course, that although EOAs tend to share the same address across all chains, uh, contract accounts don't, um, and so right. yeah. we need to be able to handle that separately. Um, but the the broader thing is that the the emphasis here is on providing the same level of security as L1 while reducing the transaction fees. So the reason the L2s are valuable here is it enables you to to not just update your own ENS name, but also potentially to issue subdomains uh, and to do that trustlessly to third parties and so forth without having to engage in any transactions on L1, which, you know, if, you're, if your user is signing up to a wallet for the first time and it's, it's 5 to $50, depending on gas fees, to set up their name, they're going to be quite discouraged. Yeah, okay, now that makes sense. And so then, so then L2s, I mean, practically speaking, L2s have, w would have sort of a, uh, a um, like a, a, an equivalent subdomain, or are we talking about like a, like if I'm, if I'm sev3.0.eth on Ethereum, would I also be sev3.0.eth on Optimism or whichever L2 I'm using? It's, it's, it's really up to you. We've got a sort of two orthogonal things here. One is how your name resolves and so you can have your name resolved to the same address for every chain id or it can resolve to a different address for each chain id uh, and then there's where the records are actually stored so you could store all your records on l1 but still encode you know addresses for half a dozen different chains or you could store your records all on uh, arbitrum but uh you know all you ever return is an ethereum l1 address you know there's we've sort of separated the two so you can you can choose how that's divided up Okay, and what what are the complexities in terms of you know, wallets integrating this and having to resolve uh, as, across like multiple L2s in order to avoid collisions? 
Yeah, this is one of the nice things about the CCIP read approach is the wallets and the apps and so forth. They don't have to be aware of all these different L2s. We don't have to update the resolution processes, you know, for each L2 we support. Because these CCIP read gateways, as you observe, they, they pose an availability risk, but there's no trust there. And they take the job of translating the contracts requests into, you know, actual, you know, ETH get proof calls or whatnot on the L2 in question. Um, and so clients and wallets simply need to implement a single unified DNS resolution process. And anyone can then permissionlessly add new data storage mechanisms for ENS. Okay. Now, um, I was reading about the ENS wrapper, uh, which um, is like a fairly new implementation that also is involved in the process of, well, from what I understand it, the, you know, what the challenge was that ENS names were themselves NFTs, but the subdomains were not, right? Uh, the ENS wrapper now enables uh, subdomains to also be NFTs and inherit properties from the, say, not the top level, but the the the, the main domain, right? Um, how, how does that work and what is the role of the ENS wrapper with regards to L2s? Yeah, so so as you observe, like uh, subdomains aren't ERC721 or 1155 NFTs because ENS actually launched before either of those standards existed. Um, so while you can transfer around subdomains just like any other NFT, uh, they, they use their own interface for that. One of the things the name wrapper was was created to do was to uh, you know improve that and, and give a single unified interface to all names. Uh, but the essential thing that it's there for is that um, it makes it much easier to trustlessly issue subdomains. So it's always been possible to trustlessly issue subdomains, but it's required a bit of sort of smart contract engineering on the part of the owner of the name because. Ultimately, in ENS, every name has control over all its subdomains. So if I own wallet.eth, I could I could issue you, you know, your name.wallet.eth, but uh, then I could take it back at any time. And if you want subdomains to actually be useful to people, then you need to have some way to credibly say, I've revoked my permission to do that. You know, once I give you the name, you can feel assured that it will continue to be your name. Uh, and so that's what the wrapper provides. You can wrap a name. Uh, and then we have what we call fuses, which are a way of revoking your own permissions over a name. So you can wrap it and then you can uh, burn the fuses to say that you can't unwrap it and to say that when you issue a subdomain, uh, you can't control it any further. Only the subdomain owner can. Um, and so those permissions make it possible to, to issue trustless subdomains and also to do that in a way that allows... Um, uh, allows you to change how subdomains are issued uh, and move to newer technology and so forth and upgrade your contracts without imposing any risk on the user that you'll use that opportunity to, to reissue names and so forth. Uh, the way this combines with L2 is a bit further down the roadmap, but basically would, would allow you to say, well, if you migrate a name to L1, then it gets all these same guarantees as a name wrapper. Uh, and while on L2, you can uh, there are other permissions you can burn to say, you know, I the the subdomains will always resolve using this CCIP read gateway or using this verifier for the gateway. So I can update the URL, but I can't change how it verifies and therefore it will always use optimism or whatnot. Okay. What what are some other applications of this uh, CCIP read gateway other than the ENS? Um, I mean, you know, there are broader implications in, in ENS itself, like the gasless DNS sec stuff I implemented. You know, we're effectively treating DNS like the L2. Um, there are definitely uses outside that. Uh, one of the, the neater ones I've seen is around uh, tokens. So, for instance, your data URI uh, could, uh, your, you know, your data function to get metadata for a token could use CCIP read and therefore return sort of on-chain data that's verified by the smart contract. Um, but is actually hosted externally to save on gas fees, for instance. Or, in fact, the very existence of the token could be sort of virtual and realized via these callbacks until such point as you claim it. So you could airdrop a bunch of NFTs to people with zero on-chain gas cost because they're only, they only exist in a database until the person claims them. Right, right. And then I guess the limitation is, like, how long do you want to keep the database up uh, for people to be able to claim them? Right. I mean, it... it just thinking about this, I mean, are there 
could these off-chain reads be used in lieu of uh, of leveraging uh, an on-chain oracle in some cases where the trust model allows it? And are, are some contracts using that? And and CCIP read uh, calls can actually be used in transaction contexts as well. So you can use that data you get back from the callback to actually make a transaction, which effectively makes it into a sort of a push oracle rather than a, a pull oracle. Um, or perhaps I'm getting the two terms wrong way around. But in any case, you can fetch the data from the oracle or from the external system and submit it at the time it's actually needed rather than needing to you know have some system that regularly updates Ethereum state. Right. And would this also extend, I mean, it's like, a, yeah, it, it, could, could you also use this with, um, in complement with verifiable off-chain computations where like a server is, uh, is performing a, a computation, right? Maybe like with a, um, a ZKVM or like a Wasm ZKVM or something like that, right? And it's returning back um, it's returning back of uh, some some data uh, with a proof. Is that is that also possible? Absolutely, as long as the proof can be verified inside the EVM, you can use it for it. So, you know, we we talk about it as an L two solution, but really it is a generic, you know, verifiable sort of potentially trustless off chain data fetching system. Okay, well, wow, that's really interesting. This brings up like so many questions. Like, <laughs> um, what's the implication here? What's the broader implication of this uh, of this um, the CCIP read on just the necessity for yeah on chain oracles, off chain uh, computation services, and sort of this whole um, part of the stack that has built its business model on the ability to provide verifiable data to, to chains. I think it's, it's more a, a new technology and a new interface for doing that rather than it is removing the need for that. You know, we ultimately, we still need that data from off chain. We still have the questions of like what degree of verifiability you can provide. Um, what this does is it provides an API where it's much more transparent and easier to integrate for apps. Um, and it, you know, it provides a situation where you can write apps that are actually using this off-chain data on demand without your app even having to know or care about that. So, you know, your um, you know claim of the airdrop tokens could just look like a simple ERC-20 transfer function to the app. Uh, you know, you could claim your airdrop just by transferring it, you know, into an account. Um, but behind the scenes, it's all using all of this, uh, all of this infrastructure. So what it really does is just improve the developer experience and uh, improve the ease of use of all of this. Very cool. Yeah, I'll have to spend a little bit more time researching this. Yeah, we're coming back to the L2s, uh, you know, of course, I think, you know, when, when, when thinking about integrating ENS with Ethereum L2s, we're, we're, we're thinking about um, EVM L2s. But you know, I think... In, in the future, we we do expect to have non EVM L twos. I think with um, with the growth of Eigenlayer, also we we can expect uh, Ethereum security to um, to be rented by non EVM uh, platforms. Um, what's the um, what's, what are the implications here for ENS and making ENS compatible? And this sort of comes back to the first topic we were talking about earlier with you know this collision and uh, so the multiple namespaces. Um, what are some of the plans to make that possible? Let's say like someone wants to build a Cosm Wasm VM uh, secured by Ethereum security and bring ENS to, to, the, to, that, to, that, uh, to that app. Um, how would that be possible? Yeah, so in terms of the namespace, of course, all of this, um, you know, all of our efforts around CCIP read are, are pretty much they exist in order to ensure we have that one unified namespace. And so I've talked before about the importance of avoiding collisions or multiple registrations, but it's also equally about making sure that you can resolve names anywhere. You know, we shouldn't have a system where, you know, a, an optimism wallet can only resolve optimism based names and an Ethereum wallet can only resolve Ethereum based names. Um, and so, you know, with CTIP read, we're able to provide that bridge. 
uh, and that bridge can be to to non EVML twos. You know, again, as long as you can verify the responses, you can do it. What that looks like is a little more varied because, of course, non EVML twos have a much larger design space. So it's a matter of finding a way to uh, to build that out, and and that will likely require you know L two specific engineering um, to build appropriate registries on the L twos and so forth. Um, when it comes to resolution, ultimately it's still it starts at Ethereum, you know. So even if you're resolving a, um, you know, a um, zk sync based name um, or a name that resolves to a zk sync identifier, you still start by the pro- the lookup process by by querying Ethereum. Okay, yeah, it makes sense. And and are yeah, what's been the adoption of ENS you know, on on L twos? Like which uh, L twos are currently using it or do you expect we'll um, start start using ENS? So you know, the, the, because it's open and permissionless, it's been a little bit. Uh, you know, we don't have a central database in that sense. So, for instance, Coinbase started off on their own internal private uh, database when they issued .cb.id names, which all use CCIP read, uh, and they've since moved on to Base. Uh, we've got uh, a generic gateway that we've, we've been building very recently, which allows for very trivially building gateways to just about any L2. Uh, and we have stood up official gateways for uh, optimism for that so far. But we're planning to expand that to Arbitrum and to any other, you know, OP and R based L2s that pop up. Um, and, you know, from there to others, because it's quite easy to add new verification mechanisms for them. Um, thus far, Adoption outside like large integrations like Coinbase has been a little slow because most people don't have the resource to uh, resources to build their own uh, you know link their own gateway and so that's what our generic gateways are, are intended for is to make it much easier so give us you know a quarter or so and you'll see people moving their names and their hosting to to L2s uh, you know easily through a UI zero code. Uh, which is what we've been working on unlocking at the moment. Cool. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk about um, about Coinbase a little bit. So, I mean, they recently announced the CB.ID um, ENS name that uh, works across the Coinbase platform. Yeah. What what's the um, how, how does that work, and uh, how how many new users have has ENS re- received from from that integration? It's uh, it's hard to say because it's all off chain, but we know it's in the millions. Uh, you know, simply because they're onboarding their entire user base. Um, CB.id is a great example of of both our DNS integration and our our off chain integration working together. You know, CB.id is an ENS name, even though it's also a DNS name, and Coinbase simply imported it one time into ENS and then can treat it just the same as a .eth name. And the way they've They've used it then as to actually set it up with CCIP read. Initially, as I said, it sort of you consulted their internal database for resolution, but they've they've since moved it to using uh, data stored on uh, base, uh, understandably, uh, which means that they can uh, provide they can prove to you that you know you're the one in ultimate control of how your name resolves. Yeah, I haven't tried it yet, but um, I'll have to. To create my CB.ID uh, name, yeah. One of the one of the ways that I've been using ENS, that I mean, so you know, I've got a couple of like ENS domains for for like my own my own personal use. But one of the ways that I've been using it that's been um, really really helpful, and it's I mean, it's very basic use case, I guess. But uh, it's just naming all of all of the wallets that I use with like. You know, I've got this. I've got this kind of like namespace, like my own namespace that I've created, and um, and you know, the same way I guess that you would like name servers in your in your LAN or your you know your your, your gateway, and um, so you know, as a fund manager, like we have several uh, um, we have several uh, Gnosis safes and, and and different addresses that we use, and we've just like named every one of them. And we know that like this is the address that we use for this, and this is the address that we use for that, and that's made it very easy for for us to you know, do capital calls with our LPs, for example. We just like give them an ENS name and just verify that ENS name with them instead of like an um, an address. And just you know, when you're looking at your wallet, you just know okay, like these are the names that I use, and 
they're sort of like unique to me and I know what they are, but, um, but that's, that's been a really cool use case. And, you know, couple that with, um, the ability to like really easily, um, buy ETH, ETH with a credit card on like any of these sort of like credit card, um, the services where you can buy ETH and you can basically like set up brand new addresses that have never sort of touched the outside that have never been touched by your own personal addresses or sort of like quarantined. Right. And, and, um, and to some extent, uh, uh, shielded from your, from your other identities, uh, because you can sort of put gas fees there. So we, we've been using that quite extensively to like set up, you know, an array of addresses that we, that we use that we don't want to like be connected with our own personal identity. So I, f- I found that really, uh, like a great, great use case and something that we've been implementing, um, at the fund. Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely the right, right way to handle it and to treat on-chain privacy. Like it, a lo- the connection between on-chain privacy and naming comes up a lot. And the thing I always emphasize is that, um, you know, not naming your accounts is, is security through obscurity. You, it seems harder to track, but in reality, a determined person can certainly, you know, figure out which accounts are yours and so forth. The ENS doesn't solve the problem, but nor does it cause it. You know, the it sort of makes it more obvious both to you and to others, uh, you know, what the account is for. And nine times out of ten, that's a benefit. And when it's not, you need to follow processes like you describe and make sure that the accounts you want to be separate are actually, you know, held separately and, and set up separate. Yeah. Yeah, it was a bit of a, like, we had to implement sort of a process to do it because, like, I messed up a few, right? Where it's like, okay, I'm going to send some ETH over here. Ah, like, no, like I wasn't supposed to do that. So it is also about having like a, a good offsite processes internally to make sure that like those things don't, don't touch. Um, but, um, yeah, I was, I was chatting with a guy in, in, uh, in Istanbul a couple of weeks ago, we were there for Cosmoverse and, um, he was building this, um, uh, this, uh, the site called zero X PPL, right? Zero X people. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, and it's sort of one of these like D bank type services, um, but with really in depth, um, sort of data on interactions between, uh, between addresses. So you, you sort of like go to one address and then you, you have this, uh, this hub and spoke thing that shows you all the other addresses that it's interacted with. And, you know, I, I think I'm, fairly good with my security and my offsec, but then, you know, in, in, in a couple of clicks, he showed me that I, I had not, you know, properly implemented this process. And like these two addresses that I thought were not linked together had been linked together somehow, uh, including like payments to, to other folks. And so, you know, talking about privacy, like, you know, what, one of the other things about this, this service is that now, you know, they're integrating and I'm sure all the big sort of like chain analysis and sort of competitors to chain analysis are doing the same thing as implementing large language models to decipher connections between addresses. And and this is what they were doing, right? Where you can just say, okay, what are the addresses that this particular address has been, um, have been, have interacted with, or, you know, which address, which Ethereum addresses, uh, were participate, participated in the, in the cosmos, um, token sale, for instance, you know, like you could sort of push it to that extent. What, like, have you thought about large language models and how they conflict with the idea of on-chain privacy and what are some of the best practices that we can implement now as users of Ethereum, where Ethereum doesn't have effect of privacy on chain and what, what is your hope that we'll, you know, at some point get to full on-chain privacy? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, large language models, much like ENS, sort of expose the assumptions that we make. You know, they democratize access to this sort of functionality, um, but ultimately aren't providing you anything that wasn't already, uh, you know, there on chain. Um, The solution, I think, is better base layer privacy primitives. Um, The unfortunate thing is that, you know, politically, these things are contentious at the moment. Uh, I don't think it's an unreasonable ask that, not everybody can read my entire transaction history and see, you know, everything I do. Um, and I think if you went to most people in the real world and said, hey, can I see your bank statement? They would react with alarm. Um, but somehow when it happens on chain, it's seen as as illegitimate. Um, and so I think a lot of it is we have to sort of fight that perception that a desire for financial privacy is somehow, uh, you know, scurrilous. Uh, before we can we can see widespread deployment of some of these these primitives, 
Um, it's a it's a good connection though to like a history of like using encryption in that when it becomes the norm, it also becomes less of a target. So, you know, nobody blinks that you use SSL for every single website now, but if you only use them to watch porn or, or launder money, then it would be a, a sign of suspicion. Um, likewise, you know, chains like um, uh, Zcash, you know, seem to be treated with less intrinsic suspicion than mixes like Tornado Cash, um, simply because privacy is the default. So I think we, we need better primitives and we also need to sort of enshrine them and make them the thing that's used as much of the time as is practical rather than just in exceptional circumstances. Yeah, I mean, I've, I agree with you that like politically this this is um, very contentious. But I mean, ultimately my, my view on privacy is that it is an essential component of just the idea of, you know, just the idea of capitalism, right? Like capitalism is able to I can't remember who said this, but like capitalism exists or is able to function because we have asymmetry of information, right? And so there's this like information arbitrage between um, between market players and having like full transparency over everyone's um, everyone's transaction history, everyone's business dealings, et cetera, uh, with, with whom everybody interacts economically, uh, effectively sort of like breaks down that asymmet- that information asymmetry and we end up in so- something closer to what I guess like communism right um wh- what's the uh what's the hope do you think that that you know within the next 10 years we have you know better on-chain privacy or some, like absolute on-chain privacy would be I guess like the you know the the desirable outcome uh or or do you do you think that like this is uh, a pipe dream that will will never happen. I think it's it's difficult, and it's particularly difficult inside like an EVM based L two or an EVM based network because the system simply isn't built with it in mind. So I think if we see it, it will be through L twos that use uh, you know systems similar to zk or zk sync, uh, you know, becoming widespread and becoming the default transaction thing. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. You know, Ethereum becomes a sort of a clearing network, and I don't think it's a problem that, you know, clearing network transactions are public, um, you know, in the same way that I would love to see more more transparency into the operation of, like, you know, central banks and so forth. There's financial privacy most benefits individuals and companies, not, you know, banks and, and governments. Um, I don't know how practical this is. It's... You know, aside from the political thing, it's a large technical challenge and having both financial privacy, you know, and, and shielded transactions and also being able to engage in like arbitrary, you know, smart contracts is a really tough problem to solve. So I guess I would say I don't think we'll have it 10 years from now, but I think we might have moved the needle more in the direction of making privacy the norm and making it easier to to shield your um, you know, your assets and your transactions. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, in the context of, um, uh, you know, if we think about account abstraction and, you know, thinking more broadly about like decentralized identi- identities and how identities uh, are formed through these, you know, links to other forms of identity, right? So like, uh, you know, currently if you want to um, add some weight to your ENS identity. You can you can attach your Twitter identity to uh, to your ENS, or you know, Keybase has this model also where um, you'll uh, attest to your ownership of other pieces of identity in order to uh, bring more weight to you know your Keybase identity. It's a shame that Keybase uh, is no longer really a viable product to use. But um, you know, h- how do you think about the role of account abstraction in in forming like a real decentralized identity in the form of ENS and perhaps also adding some layers of privacy there since we can rotate keys and uh, and and that can be used in, order, in a way to uh, to abstract away the ultimate beneficiary of an, of an identity. I think uh, account abstraction in some form is going to be fairly essential to, to more widespread adoption of, of Ethereum and of you know, crypto in general, because of the usability benefits it brings. Uh, and and one of the pleasant side effects of that is that it's easier to then implement things like better financial privacy and so forth. Yeah. Um, are, 
Well, maybe maybe give an overview of um, you know what are the um, what are the advancements in account abstraction and uh, and the use of account abstraction with the NS on Ethereum. I think I mean you know I I don't follow the area of research in as much detail as I, I maybe should, but. You know, to my awareness, there's sort of two general approaches. One is that we can enshrine and account abstraction in the the base layer in the EVM um, with things like auth call and so on, which basically allow you to treat a a special contract account like an EOA uh, and transact from it, um, and that provides you know sort of a, a more direct way to do things, and it also sidesteps you know a bunch of difficulties around uh, you know gas and transaction fees and so forth. Um, things like that are promising, but large changes to the EVM tend to take a while, and it's all too easy to have unintended side effects. You know, and hence the the, the understandable caution in implementing them. Uh, you know, the second way is through uh, you know authorizations through uh, you know meta transactions and so forth, where all of this happens in the abstract. Uh, you know, in the in the user layer, um, that's much more practical, and it's happening now. But also the user experience tends to be a bit worse, and it's a bit there's a lot more infrastructure to set up, you know. So your user then has to sign a message and serve a transaction. That then has to be sent to some sort of relayer. The relayer has to handle, you know, how to pay gas fees and how to be reimbursed. And then either the user or the platform has to somehow, you know, translate, uh, you know, the right amount of funds into to pay the gas fees, and it all gets very complicated. But we can implement it, you know as we wish without waiting for everyone to be in agreement. Um, in either case, you know, ENS sort of continues to function the same way. You know, we we can name contract accounts just the same as naming uh, externally owned accounts. Um, you can transact from them just fine. You know, there's nothing sort of intrinsically linked to ENS to, to external accounts. So fortunately, we, we work with account abstraction really well. And, you know, being able to name those accounts can also improves the UX a lot and you end up with more of them to keep track of uh, than you might otherwise. Yeah, I saw the um, the, the Comes team has a really nice implementation of, of account abstraction in, in their in their game. And um, yeah, it's like, it's it's great how, just how well it works. You, you just, you uh, you open the app, uh, it creates uh, it creates a wallet, you connect that wallet to say like a passkey and and then you know further on as you sort of add assets to that wallet it might ask you to like connect it to different uh forms of identity or, or different um uh, signing mechanisms and yeah the onboarding experience is is pretty incredible you know in terms of enshrinement uh maybe an interesting uh sort of example to look towards is um is osmosis on on um, on cosmos so they're they're building a kind of abstraction into the protocol now of course for for osmosis, it's different, right? Because they're an app chain, they can sort of like control the entire stack. Um, but um, uh, like a month ago, they demoed this uh, uh, this really sort of nice way to build account abstraction where existing addresses, existing EOA addresses uh, could be turned into um, uh, abstracted accounts. And then you can effectively like connect different pass keys, Twitter accounts, or like any OAuth uh, in, in order to to sign, and then also have um, uh, different signing mechanisms based on the types of transactions that you're participate that you're that you're issuing, right? So if it's like a a swap transaction or like a send token transaction, you may need like a certain amount of keys to do that. Uh, however, if you're just like voting on a government's proposal or performing some other action that doesn't involves transferring funds, you might be able to just do that with like you know, your, your Twitter login or your Google login or something like that. So like having also permissions built in the protocol is really nice. I mean, that's one of the benefits of having an app chain, I guess, is that you can sort of, um, you know, you can, you can have total control over that, but I understand that like for something like Ethereum, it's much, it's much more difficult to enshrine that into the protocol where, you know, there's so many applications and sort of L2s depending on that, that, that base layer. So it's, it's, it's an interesting challenge to have to deal with, of course. It's interesting you bring that up because you just reminded me that so a couple of years ago, I proposed in the IP that would implement something very similar. Uh, never got much tra traction, unfortunately. But the basic insight is: what if you could? What if an EOA could delegate call? So you would have a special transaction type that, instead of just calling a, a, a contract, delegate calls it, and therefore it executes as the EOA. 
And in principle, this would require a fairly minimal set of changes to the EVM because all of that infrastructure, all of that, that mechanism is already in place. Um, unfortunately, it didn't get a lot of traction. There are a couple of odd edge cases around it, but I think it would be tractable um, and you know potentially provide a much simpler mechanism than some of the other ones that have been proposed. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing like more, uh, a counter traction come come to Ethereum in, in more tangible ways. And um, yeah, I think we'll get there uh, eventually, right? There's already some 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 impl- implementations of it. So yeah, maybe looking to um, looking to the future of ENS and reflecting in the last six years. Um, so I think it's I think it's safe to say that ENS is one of the um, like largest or if not the largest DAO in Ethereum, um, also generating revenue, right? There was this one day, uh, earlier this year where ENS generated like upwards of $235,000 in, in domain fees in a day. Um, you know, millions, I think it's two, 2.4 million addresses, uh, active ENS names. Yeah. What do you, what do you think of all this? And, you know, how do you reflect on like the last six years? and where uh, ENS has gotten to today? Uh, it's certainly been a journey. Um, we always intended to to decentralize ENS over time. When we launched was, we launched not long after the, the DAO, uh, and so we weren't exactly keen to be like, hey, let's launch and straight away launch a DAO and it'll be fine. Uh, you know, we wanted to actually see governance primitives mature and, and demonstrate their effectiveness first. Um, but that absolutely happened. And, you know, two years ago, we launched the DAO and the ENS DAO. Uh, and you're right, it's, it's been, it's one of the largest, you know, by participation, it's got ongoing revenue, it's, um, you know, ongoing participation as well. And I think it's been very effective as administering the protocol. Um, I think the, the revenue is an essential part of it. The, you know, the fees were uh, for ENS names are set to regulate the system rather than directly to bring in income. You know, the idea is if names are free to register, then they'd all be registered. And the only way to get them would be to try and, you know, pay enough to the person who jumped on it first. And so we want to set that balance where it's possible to find a name that, you know, represents what we want it to, um, you know, directly and easily and in a sort of a liquid fashion rather than having the entire system squatted on immediately. You know, I've seen that sort of behavior left uncontrolled uh, has, you know, strangled ecosystems like Namecoin and other early attempts. Um, but a, a very pleasant side effect of that is, of course, it generates funding, which can help, uh, you know, continue to pay for ENS development and so forth. And I think the fact that ENS has revenue that it can actually use to continue to develop, pay for development, it's meant that we haven't had to you know, look for venture capital funding, which has now allowed us to stay truer to our uh, our open source and public good roots. Um, it en- enabled us to help fund other projects in the ecosystem, and you know, and relating to ENS as well. Um, and it's it really provides us with like a stable future. So you know, we've put a fifty million odd of the the amount that's been raised into an endowment, and its sole goal is to to grow stably and and safely over time. So that ENS will remain a stable operating system for the next hundred years or more, uh, you know, independent of what happens to revenue, because we also don't want to have to make decisions of, well, it would be better for the ecosystem if this fee went away because it no longer serves its purpose, but we need it in order to fund operations, so it has to stay. You know, so our ultimate goal is to be able to make those decisions independently of each other, and things like the endowment, you know, work to make that possible. Um, so I guess the thing I, I like the most about it is is it's enabled us to to maintain that independence and that attitude that what we are building is infrastructure, not you know, a money spinner, not an investment opportunity. Yeah, how much is in the endowment? Well, it varies day to day. Uh, it is a little under fifty million at the moment. I think we okay. It's divided up between ETH exposure and USDC exposure. Um, the basic in- intuition is that if somebody pays for 10 years of registration, um, we after a year, one-tenth of that is effectively being used up. You know, they've had their year of registration. And so that's money that the DAO can spend or invest as it sees fit, and that's held as USDC for stability. 
the remaining nine years are still money that was paid for a service that hasn't been rendered yet. And because it was paid in ETH, we keep it in ETH. So we still have a large ETH exposure. Um, and the DAO, therefore, uh, sorry, the endowment, therefore, is divided up into two, those two sections. And because of the ETH exposure, you know, sees some some fairly large variation over time. Our endowment manager, Karpatki, is, is very good and publishes weekly reports and monthly reports that, you know, provide a lot of detail into the, the goings on. Yeah. I mean, the, one of the interesting things about... Uh... Uh, about ENS is I think the, the 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 governance, how active it is, um, you know, the implementation of the delegate system. You know, I, I was I was sort of surprised. I mean, pl- pleasantly surprised to see that Coinbase is a large delegate and uh, fairly active in in governance. Uh, you know, I, looking to the future of of uh, of ENS and particularly the governance. You know, h- how do you think that will scale as ENS grows and you know, will, will someone will we someday see like ICANN sitting on the governance board of <laughs> of uh, of ENS? You know, and, and and other large organizations that that use the protocol. I would, yeah, I would love to see participation from uh, you know from other large organizations and stakeholders. You know, I want ENS to be built with those people in mind, and I want them to have a say in governance. Uh, I think. Ultimately, enabling that sort of thing means you know doing what we can to make it as po- as easy as possible for people to shift the delegated votes. Um, you know we've we've done that using things like free redelegation, where we use meta transactions and we pay the gas fees for redelegating your tokens. But as with any project with a token, the uh, keeping people's attention uh, and keeping them you know focused on governance and and active in it can be a problem. So we see this gradual decline in delegated token counts over time. And so uh, combating that and, and increasing governance participation and also making it very easy for delegates to step up and step down and not, you know, we want someone who comes along late to have a, a good opportunity to, to encourage a lot of people to delegate to them. Equally, we want someone who is moving on to be able to make sure that their uh, the votes delegated to them don't go to waste, you know, because they're no longer active. Um, solving challenges like that is going to be a big, a big thing going forward for the NSDAO to make sure it continues to be representative in how it governs. Yeah, I mean, go- I think like governance delegation is, uh, you know, it's it's certainly like a, a an issue that we see you know, in the Cosmos side of things as well, right? Where, you know, I think Cos- Cosmos has a Cosmos chains have a, a, a different model where validators are sort of the the de facto delegate, right? If you don't uh, vote, um, if you don't vote from your own sort of token, uh, your own tokens that your your validator votes for you, but you know that has created, I think, a a situation where I think a lot of people are dissatisfied with the way governance is uh, is conducted, right? Where it would be better for in certain in some cases maybe for things like like uh, like spending like community pool spending and things of that nature uh treasury spending uh treasury allocations uh to be governed by like a, a group of folks right so for that that uh, responsibility to be delegated to like a group of folks that are voted in by governance that can be vetoed etc but um we you know we found that I think the community is moving more towards this model where governance responsibilities are delegated to, or should be delegated to like sort of sub DAOs, right? This is kind of sub DAO idea. So, um, yeah, it's a it's an interesting problem to solve. Yeah, and and ENS approaches that a little differently with our working groups. You know that working uh, the the whole DAO elects working group stewards on a regular basis, and they have delegated authority to deal with day to day decisions. I think there is a a common misconception in you know, the decentralized community that, you know, everything has to be decided by everybody. Um, But in reality, that's just not how any large organization works. There has to be some delegation of authority. And what makes it decentralized is whether there's transparency and checks and balances over that, whether, you know, somebody who isn't representing their community can be removed and replaced rather than that every single decision, you know, gets voted on by everybody, which is exhausting and, and requires everybody to be an expert on everything. Great. Well, uh, Nick, thanks so much for coming back on and uh, sharing an update on, on ENS. Um, yeah, really, really excited that we could uh, have this conversation again and also excited to see um, ENS growing and continue to grow and be uh, a pillar for 
the way you know we should conduct governance in the space and 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 also uh, an important uh, an important component to um, bringing in more adoption into Ethereum. So yeah, ex- number go up in terms of uh, ENS uh, names created. I think is is a good metric to be looking at. Absolutely. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure.